We have a wonderful psalm set for today, Psalm 63. And I'd like us just to reflect on it this morning. I think psalms, like much of poetry, should not be overanalyzed, but rather just kind of absorbed. And we should feel what the writer of the psalm was feeling and thinking as they wrote it and uh, immerse ourselves into their experience of the psalm. So let me read it through to you, and then I'm just going to talk about a few points uh, that come out of this psalm. Psalm 63, and I'm reading the NIV version. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your life, your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. While singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadows of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. So I think there's four sections to this wonderful psalm. In the first section, we read the psalmist speaking about this deep longing for God. Uh, and he describes it as a thirst. So I want to imagine a time when you were particularly thirsty, where you were just, you felt so parched and so dry, you just were desperate for something to drink. And when you got the water, you could not drink enough. Try and remember a time where your whole body was aching for fluid, for water. We think of the other psalm that speaks about as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul longs or thirsts for you. It's a wonderful image that we get here at the beginning. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. As we encourage to have this kind of a thirst for God. And then, although David at the time of writing this is out in the desert, he then, in a sense, lifts up his eyes above the desert and kind of looks up towards heaven. Or perhaps he remembers what he has seen in the past. And we get this particularly in verse 2 where he says, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. It's as if he is reminding himself about something where he has been in a better space and he has seen and encountered God. And this, I think, is important for us as well, that when we go through times where we feel thirsty and parched and dry in our faith, or when we feel particularly besieged by the world, or under, under pressure, and things are not going well, and we wonder where God is, in our thirst we are encouraged to look towards those times when we remember having encountered God, when we know that we have seen him and encountered him. And that might not happen for all of us every day. It might only happen now and then when we have this distinct and tangible sense of being in God's presence. Those become touchstones. We go back to those, we touch them, we take hold of them, we feel them, we embrace them, we look and smell them and <laughs> taste them because they are, in a sense, the key reminders that we have seen the glory and the power of God. And when we feel that life is on top of us, these are the times that we have to go back to 
we almost need to make a list of them in a diary so we can go back and remind ourselves of these times when we have been absolutely sure that God is absolutely present and is powerful and glorious. And so the psalmist writes, I have seen you in the sanctuary and I have beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be satisfied with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. And so in the midst of this dry and barren parchedness, David is able to look towards God and give glory and praise to him because of this experience he had had previously of seeing God in his sanctuary. And then in the third section, he speaks about lying on his bed at night. And I don't know about you, but I have this when I'm under considerable stress or pressure, or when something has happened that really distresses me, I find myself lying awake and just turning like a rotisserie, just going around in circles. And my thoughts go around like windmills in my mind, just over and over and over and over again as I, as I ruminate on the things that are troubling me. And David writes quite similarly, except that he says that instead of thinking about these concerns, he thinks about God. So as he lays on his bed, he thinks about God. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night, because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you, your right hand upholds me. Do you see all the you's? Every phrase has a you. The psalmist, as he lies on his bed at night, instead of agonizing and worrying over his own issues, he turns his thoughts towards God. He lifts his mind towards God and he thinks about God. And I think that lying on our bed at night is one of the best places for us to pray. As we lie in bed, since we um, abandon ourselves to God in the darkness of the night as we lie vulnerable in our beds is a good time for us just to entrust ourselves to God and to think about him, to choose to think about him. And instead of ruminating about our problems and our worries, let's ruminate and think about God. Let us meditate on him. Let us chew on the fat of the marrow of God. And then finally, in the last three verses, David draws in a sense on his desire for protection and revenge. And these are, I must say, passages I normally try to avoid, but in the context here, this is really important. David was under considerable siege as he was out in the desert. His life was being threatened and people were maligning him. And in the context of thirsting for God and thinking about how he has seen God and remembering God, and then lying on the ground or on his bed at night in the desert and thinking about God and praying to God and surrendering himself to God, he then reaches this point of resolution where he knows that God is on his side and God will protect him. God will deliver him. God will help him find a way through. And I want to encourage you with that as well. Now, when you feel stuck and trapped and blocked and things are not working out in the way that you hoped they would, or where you feel that people are being unfair towards you, treating you badly in a way that's not justified, we turn to God and we trust that he will resolve those situations. And so David writes, those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king, which is him, the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him. And this is the resolution of the psalm. So friends, what I'd love you to take away from this as I take away from this this morning is this encouragement to thirst after God, to look deep in our bellies and to find that place where we just deeply wish that God were closer and more present and more tangible and more supportive. 
that thirsting for God is a good, healthy part of our faith. And then let us also remember those moments, there may only be a few, where you are absolutely certain that you have been in the presence of God, that you have seen God work in your life. And let us remember those. Remember those times when God has worked for you, when you have seen God, when you've been in his presence. And as we draw these two together, this thirsting, this longing, and this sureness of the strength and the presence of God, we then find ourselves in a place where we turn to him and we entrust ourselves to him and we reach that point of resolution where we know that he is working on our behalf. May the Lord bless you wherever you are in your life and may he help you to grow and deepen in your relationship with him, to become more and more dependent on him, to trust him, to know that he is there for you that he loves you, that he cares for you, and that he wants to work for you.